It really is a privilege and an honor to be here at SMCC. We're going to be looking at the book of Luke, chapter 14 this morning. If you would turn in your Bibles there with me. Luke, chapter 14. And we'll start off in verse 15. If you would stand with me as we read from God's Word, that would be wonderful. Luke 14, 15. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, Jesus said to this man, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you've commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. Thank you, Lord, for your word. You may be seated. The very first wedding that I had the privilege of performing, the parents spent over $250,000 on the ceremony and service. And it, was, it was pretty unbelievable. There were about 400 people in attendance, and many of whom they had uh, rooms provided for them at the Hotel del Coronado, which is where that wedding was at. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. The, the flower arrangements alone were just astounding. And I'm not a flower guy, and I was blown away by it. What impressed me more was the food. The food was incredible at the reception. I mean, imagine shrimp platters like six feet high. Like, how do they stack them that high? I don't understand. Filet mignon was enjoyed by everyone as we reclined and watched the Victorian dancers. And overseeing all of this from on high, on their stage and on their thrones, were the bride and groom watching down looking down in favor on all that was happening. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. I I don't know that I had ever been to anything so extravagant, nor I don't know if in this life if I ever will. And maybe you've been invited to some impressive banquets in your day. But imagine, imagine what the banquet is going to be like that God has repaired for His people. I mean... It's the the banquet that God Almighty has prepared. The one with limitless power, limitless creativity, limitless resources, and limitless grace that He desires to pour out on the guests whom He has invited. What would that look like? What would that taste like? David said in Psalm 34, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't you want to know what that tastes like? This morning we're going to be talking about the most important meal of your life. As we look at this passage in Luke chapter 14, we're crashing the dinner party already in progress. Here's a little bit of the background of what has already taken place. Jesus was invited there to share the Sabbath uh, with uh, the ruler of the Pharisees and all of his Pharisee friends and some lawyers and important people. He sat and ate with the religious elite of the Jewish faith. But unlike good dinner, uh, other good dinner guests, Jesus was not exactly making things comfortable for his, his fellow companions. At the very, the very beginning of Luke chapter 14, Jesus sits down to dinner. And he sees a man 
who is in need. He sees a man who needs healing and he wants to heal him. And he asks the guest, he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He knew exactly what their answer would be. They would probably say, ah, no, we don't work on the Sabbath. I would, I would hold off. Maybe tomorrow, Jesus. He heals the man. And there's silence. What's Jesus doing here? And after that, he turns his attention to all the guests and he begins to tell a parable how it's not good when you attend a feast or a banquet to take the best seat in the house. Instead, you should take the lowest seat for he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And again, silence. Everyone in the room thinking, is he talking about me? And I'll bet the guy who was sitting way in the back next to the door is thinking, oh, I'm so glad I sat here because if this gets any weirder, I am out. Jesus doesn't stop. He then turns his attention to the host. He says, it's not good. It's not good to invite friends and family and rich neighbors to the banquets you throw. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Do this and your reward will be great in heaven. And I can imagine the host and everyone present, just, just without air in their lungs, just what is going on? What is he doing? I'll bet you could, if the tension was so thick, you probably could have just sliced it with a knife. No one is left feeling good about themselves. But then after several moments, a hero emerges. He says, I'm going to save this party. And he rises up and breathes lung, uh, breath into his lungs and he says, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. It, it was kind of like saying, So, uh, what about those Dodgers? Or what about this weather we've been having? Do you think it's ever going to rain? Man, it's hot outside. Or, or commenting on the food and just saying, you know, these peas, they're bursting forth with country fresh flavor. <laughs> let's talk about that. It was, it was a let's get Jesus on a new topic so that he'll make us all feel better. That's the kind of move that he was trying to make. And Jesus likes to talk about the kingdom, right? Well, let's get him to talk about how nice it will be when we all sit down together at the heavenly banquet. What a gracious thing for this guy to say. I'm sure it was a noble gesture, a noble comment. I'm sure the guests really appreciated it, especially the host. Okay, let's change the topic. Let's change the mood here. Let's lighten things up. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. You see, this man like... Other Jews was well aware that God was preparing a great banquet for His people. He had read passages like Isaiah 25.6. The prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to that day when the feast would be ready. And he writes this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all the peoples a rich feast, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. That's good news. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of His people He will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We've waited for Him that He might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. That's what they were looking forward to. They had been invited to the party. They're just waiting for the moment when God says, It's ready. Come and get it. Come eat. And this man probably thought he was saving this dinner party by putting happy thoughts into everyone's minds, changing the conversation. But Jesus wasn't going to play along. Instead, he bursts his bubble and he says, you want to talk about the kingdom? Let's talk about the kingdom. And as usual, Jesus tells a story. He starts in verse 16. He said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, everything is is now ready. 
For weddings today, people often send out a save the date. They'll send it out months and months in advance. They want people to block out that space on their calendars. And then as the wedding gets closer, usually a month or so out, they'll send out the official invite. And you'll get a little card where you can respond. You can RSVP whether or not you're going to come to the banquet. Well, in this day, if you were throwing a wedding banquet, you would send out invitations and get RSVPs well in advance. And then once you knew who was coming, you'd begin to make your preparations for the big day. Once everything was ready, you'd send out a messenger and say, it's time. Everything's been set. Everything is ready. That's what Jesus is describing here. He's saying the preparations are finished. The food's been purchased. The tables have been set. The meat's on the grill. It's sizzling. It smells great. Appetizers are out. Come to the banquet. It's time. But Jesus wasn't just telling a fun dinner story here. Jesus, of course, is alluding to the reality of God's banquet that everyone's been looking forward to. He's saying, it's now ready. He said it many times before. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When he sent out his disciples in Matthew 10, 7, he said, Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Luke 4, verse 16, he's in the synagogue in Nazareth. He stands up and reads from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls up the scroll and he hands it to the attendant and he sits down. Eyes of all that says were fixed on him. And he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Just like all the others, this parable that Jesus is about to tell, it's more than just an entertaining story. Jesus was going to share something very, very important. After having made all the necessary preparations, the master of the house calling everyone on the list to come. But verse 18 brings a twist. Verse 18 says, But they all alike began to make excuses. Excuses can be really useful tools, can't they? When you really don't want to do something or go somewhere or attend something, rather than telling the brutally honest truth, you decide to make yourself look better and make your, uh, the one who invited you feel better by making some sort of excuse. Excuses aren't all equal, are they? We've all heard of the good ones, we've heard of the bad ones, and we've heard of the ones that just... They just explode. They just don't work. Years ago, a magazine for teenagers compiled a list of actual excuses for missing school that were turned in by students. They aren't good. My son is under a doctor's care and could not take PE yesterday. Please execute him. (laughs) Or please excuse Cynthia for being absent. She was sick and I had her shot. Please excuse Danny for being, it was his father's fault. Those are pretty ridiculous, right? Who's going to believe that? It doesn't take a psychiatrist to look at those and and say, hey, uh, there is something fishy going on here. But these excuses that Jesus mentions in his parable, I don't think they're all that far off in terms of ridiculous. The first man says, I've bought a field and I need to go check it out. That sounds somewhat reasonable on the surface, right? You spent some money. You want to go see what you got for your money. But think about this. Who buys a piece of property without seeing it first? And even if that is true, that you you didn't see it, how long is it really going to take? All evening? I mean, you didn't buy the Taj Mahal here. You don't need to go look at every room and check the plumbing and all that kind of stuff. You bought a field. Are you going to go turn over the rocks and see what's under there? 
And even if, even if you haven't seen it, and even if it's going to take a really long time, how are you going to be able to see it in the dark? The banquets were often thrown in the evening, and even if they started in the daylight, they often went long into the evening. How long is this going to take? You don't have floodlights, and it just seems like that excuse is a little on the weak side. The second man says, I've bought five yoke of oxen. I've bought ten animals, and I'm on my way to check them out. That makes sense. If I had bought a new car, definitely I, I want to go check it out as well. A lot of people buy cars online these days, and you, you, you go around, I totally understand this, you go around to different dealerships, and you don't like haggling with the dealer, so you just go around and you test drive different cars until you find the one you want, and then in the comfort of your own home, you're sipping coffee, and you make your purchase online. You have it either shipped to you, or you just go pick it up. I can see that. I can see buying a new car online. I can't see buying a used car online. I, I, can't, I can't imagine purchasing a car that I, I don't know what condition is, it is in, or if it's going to really perform, or even if it's going to be the same car that I saw in the picture. Have you ever been looking through Auto Trader magazine and you come across like 1998 Corvette, and then you look down and there's a picture of a Volkswagen Beetle? It doesn't inspire confidence, does it? Does it? Oxen were not the kind of animals that you just bought to, to tie up to your front porch and, and show off for their beauty. Uh, you didn't buy them for their looks, at least I don't think so. They were, they were work animals. You wanted them to perform a task. They were the tractors of the day. And who in their right mind would go out and buy ten of them without knowing if these animals can really perform what they're supposed to perform. Are they in good working condition? I hope they're in great working condition. Anything else would just be foolish, I would think. The third man seems to have the most legitimate excuse of all. He says, I got married. And you say, well, why can't you come? Well, my wife won't let me. You say, okay, enough said. I got it. Not going to argue with that. But when you think about it, even this excuse seems a little shaky as well. I mean, if you knew you were going to get married, then why do you say yes to the invitation in the first place? It's not like you, you ran, out and got mar- uh, ran out to Vegas and got married on a whim. Jewish weddings were extremely elaborate. They took a really, really long time to prepare for. And if you knew you were going to get married six months a year ago, then why do you say yes to my invitation last week? But we can give these guys the benefit of the doubt and we can assume that all these excuses are legitimate. Okay, but one thing is certain here. All of these excuses shout loud and clear this message. There are other things in my life that are more important to me than attending your banquet. These people, they weren't saying I shouldn't come. They weren't saying, I won't try to come some other time. They're saying, I just don't want to come right now. I've got better, more important things to do right now. And the sad thing is, they didn't realize there would be no later. There would be no second chance. No future invitation. This is it. I love my little three-year-old. She is just this beautiful little package bursting with energy. And uh, it, she's so wonderful to spend time with. But there are some times, like when we're sitting down at dinner and, and we've made this wonderful meal for her in the microwave, and uh, we're sitting there with her and uh, we're saying, eat your food, eat your food. And she sees something, a toy or something like that, and she wants down. And it's, can I get down? Can I get down? And uh, we say, no, you've got to eat your food. You've got to finish your food. This is our dinner. This is all we're having tonight. We're not having any treats. No more snacks. This is it. Are you sure? She says, yes. And so she gets down and she goes and plays. And then eventually we're getting ready for bed and we've brushed teeth and we've changed and we've done the story and we've prayed and we're getting her tucked into bed. And she looks at me, Daddy, can I have a snack? <laughs> and your heart breaks and you say, then why didn't you listen when I told you you needed to eat? It's too late. You missed the boat. How? Remember next time. 
In student ministry, often you, you're signing kids up for camps or you're going on missions trips like uh, the kids are going on today. Um, and uh, it's so hard to get these students to commit and to sign up. And often you'll just plead, please sign up, please sign up, please sign up. There's a deadline here. Don't go past the deadline. And I've, I always have students coming up to me and saying, a day before, I want to go to camp now. And it's heartbreaking to say, did you not hear? Did you not hear the call? The deadline passed weeks ago. And when you didn't sign up, there were other church kids that wanted to go and and those spots were filled. We had to give them away to them. I'm sorry. There's no room. That's exactly what happens in Jesus' story. When the servant comes back to report the news to his master, Jesus says, The master of the house became angry. Verse 21. That's not surprising. I mean, who wouldn't be upset? If people told you they were coming to your banquet, and you went out and you bought all the food, and you cleaned the house, and you set the tables, and you spent a huge amount of money, time, and energy, and for what? So you could sit there and enjoy the banquet by yourself? And not only that, think about how insulting this whole thing would be. I mean, these people have no regard for the work that you went through. They care more about the things that can wait, things they already own, or a relationship that they're going to have for the rest of their lives than a special dinner opportunity that may never come around again. And the master of the house, he had every right to be upset. But check out what he does with his anger. He doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't start cursing. He doesn't start throwing food. He doesn't post nasty things about all those invited on Facebook. He doesn't call up his friends and say, can you believe what so-and-so did to me? Instead, in his anger, he chooses to bless others. We and everyone else attending this feast that Jesus was at knew exactly who the master was that Jesus was talking about. The master was God. He says to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. These were the people who had no money to buy fields or oxen. They had no money to to throw big lavish weddings. These were the people who didn't need to be convinced that they were needy. They knew they were needy. They didn't, these were the people who the Pharisees would have often called the unclean, the unworthy, the ones who they wouldn't want to have anything to do with because I don't want to get any dirt on myself. The Master says, go to these people. And the servant comes back and says, Sir, what you've commanded has been done and still there's room. And the Master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. The Pharisees wouldn't have liked hearing this. They would have known who Jesus was probably talking about. He he was talking about the ones whom Isaiah said were far in Isaiah 57, 19. These were the ones who were not invited at first. They were not God's chosen people. They were the reprobates. They were the pagans. They're the ones that Paul talks about in Ephesians 2.12 to the Gentiles, Paul says. Remember that you were, at a time, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, You who were once out on the highways and the hedges, he says, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus was condemned by religious leaders time and time again for associating with types like these, with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with people committing all kinds of other sins. And when the man at dinner said, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom, I guarantee you, he didn't have these people in mind. They probably weren't on his list. And I'll bet if we went out to Paseo, Colorado, or we went out to the Santa Anita Mall and asked people walking around who they thought that God would invite to a banquet, I'll bet we would get answers like this. People go to church. 
people who read their Bible a lot or who donate to charity or who are nice, who contribute to society. Maybe those Greenpeace people over there, they seem like they're doing something. I guarantee it wouldn't be the homeless guy who hangs out by the train tracks or the girl who's strung out on drugs, the guy who just walked out on his wife and three kids, that guy over there wearing that offensive T-shirt, or those, those teenagers who can't seem to get one single sentence out without dropping a four-letter word. The Master says, go to these people. Compel them to come in. Don't force them to come in, but tell, urge them. Tell them that they have nothing to lose, so much to gain. Make them realize that this is an opportunity they can't afford to pass up. Do whatever it takes. Get them here. And then he utters deafening words in verse 24. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. And I wonder if, at that moment, the people who were there listening to Jesus, they had scripture that they had memorized popping into their brain. Things like Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. Or maybe the call of wisdom in Proverbs 1.24. Because I have called you and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you've ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me. But I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Those are really sobering words. And I wonder what the man who said, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom. I wonder what he was thinking then. The message of this parable, I believe, includes three elements of application a warning an invitation, and a mission. It was a warning to the Jews, and and I think all religious people. The the Jews had been invited to the banquet. They had been looking forward to it. God said, come, I'm here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The feast is ready. Jesus says, all these prophecies that you have, they were about me. All of your history, it points to me. I'm what you've been waiting for. Salvation is here. But for so many, when they heard the invitation, they refused to accept the call. They refused to accept Jesus. Why would anyone do that? Who turns down a free gift? I think religious people do. People have worked so hard to make themselves look and feel so holy. People like the rich young man that asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus told him, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And I'll bet he brightened up. He said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. I'm the perfect candidate for the kingdom. I'm ready. I I should be the one that should be saved. And I think that so many people are right there with them. And they say, I go to church. I read my Bible. I stay away from those nightclubs. I don't look at pornography. I'm faithful to my wife or husband. I don't cheat on tests. I don't tease my brothers or sisters. I don't steal candy for babies. The Gospel of Mark tells us, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. He said to him, you lack one thing. Go Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The young man was so proud of his ability to obey in many things. So proud that he was blind to see that his affections, the affections of his heart, they weren't for God, they were for something else. He didn't see his need for Jesus. And even when he did, he could not trade his first love for the greatest love. 
What about us? Have you become so confident in your ability to do good that you don't see your need to fully embrace the invitation that Christ gives? I've been there. Or maybe you do recognize your need for God and you come here and you sit in a pew week after week hoping to one day get yourself clean enough that God will one day approve. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says that your greatest attempts at cleaning yourself up, they're like putting on filthy rags. One pastor said, it's an awareness of the fact that we are dirty that makes the bath so attractive. People who don't realize or refuse to affect the, the, the fact that they're dirty, they don't take showers. Jesus' invitation is to people who need a shower, and they know it. He's calling us to recognize our failures and see the corrupting effects of our sin and to come running to His table of forgiveness. But the warning is this. To reject the invitation may mean that you will one day be shut out. There's a warning. There's an invitation. And that invitation, thank God, is still open to people even today. God says everything is ready. Nothing more is needed for your salvation. Jesus did it all when He died for your sin on the cross. He just defeated death by rising from the grave. You'll, you'll never be good enough. You'll never be religious enough. You're not okay. Come and be forgiven. And yet people delay. And I scratched my head many times and wondered, what are you you waiting for here? Why? Why are you delaying? And they make excuses and they say, I've got plenty of time to accept the invitation another day. Right now, I've got other more important things to do. I've got money to make. I've got classes to take. I've got people to date. I've got kids to raise. I've got a life to make for myself. I'll get to that later. And all these things may be good, but they can keep us from what is best. Don't say, I'll come late, because you may not be able to. A warning, an invitation, and finally there's a mission. There's a mission. The job of the servant in this parable is the job of every one of us who has already embraced the invitation and placed our trust in Jesus Christ. We're not to be people who sit down at the table and fold our arms and say, hey, can I get another helping of mashed potatoes over here? Isn't it great to be with God's people? Yes, it is great. What a wonderful thing to be able to come and gather as the body of Christ and to serve one another and love each other. That is part of being the body. And yet we were created in Christ to do good works and to share our faith. We're not to just sit still. In fact, the fact that we're here, knowing that we were in the same shape that so many others out there are in, and it's only by the grace of God that we're sitting at this table, that should move us out of our seats. Out onto the highways. Out onto the hedges. Urging people. Come in. And you might say, but I've invited. They're not coming. They're making excuses They've decided to go elsewhere. We still have room in the building, but no one's coming. And God says, go out again. Tell everyone the good news. The banquet's ready. Don't just go to your friends and don't just go to people like you. Go to the poor. Go to the outcast. People who can't repay you. Because my house will be filled. Are you out there extending an invitation? Are you grabbing all that you can, telling them how good this meal is that you've tasted? Do you look outside your door and see people who are starving to death? People whose marriages are falling apart, whose finances are in a state of ruin, whose hearts are wrecked with emotional pain, or whose lives have been trashed by drugs, alcohol, pornography. Those are the people we need to grab and say, I've tasted something that you need. Can I share it with you? This is the most important meal of your life. Alistair Begg sums this passage up like this. He says, There's a warning. Better heed it. There's an invitation. Better accept it. There's a mission. We better go on and do it. 
SMCC is, is God's church. He established it. He blessed it. He sustained it. He's not finished with it. And as you enter into this new season, season of maybe some uncertainty, maybe some anxiety, remember, you're seated at the banquet of the Most High. You have a hope and a future, and you have a call. There are a lot of highways, a lot of communities, a lot of people who still need an invitation. Let's pray. Lord, what an honor it is to read your word, to crack it open and and know that this is the word of God. And to have it pierce our hearts and our souls. Lord, I pray that your word would transform us this morning. I pray for those who might be here and they might be playing some sort of religious game. And they might not have come to that point where they said, yes, I am dirty and I do need a shower. I do need what Jesus did on the cross as He took every single one of my sins there upon Himself, and He paid for every last one. I need that. And I pray for those, if there are any in this room this morning, Lord, that they might say, Lord, I need You. I surrender. This game I've been trying to play, of trying to be good enough, I can't do it. And I need, I need what Jesus Christ did. Come in, wash me clean, make Become my Lord and Savior. And for the rest of us, Lord, who are here and many, many faithful attenders who have been here for years and years ministering to the body, ministering to the community, may they not lose heart. May they be encouraged and given uh, fresh energy and vitality to go out and to extend invitations to answer the call, Lord, and trust that You are going to work. We love you, Lord. I thank you for this church. I pray that you would bring great blessing and many, many more years of fruitful ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.